it's a true blessing to have a professional where you can put your heart and soul into it. So it, you, it's, it is a blessing to be able to be able to do that. I'm fortunate to have a partner who raised me family and our garage and he guides me to make sure my heart and soul is in the right place and I'm doing it for the right uh, reasons. So I would say that that before we talk about the toll, we have to talk about what the blessing is. But yes, it is the case that if you really do this at a high level, it might mean less hours of sleep. It's going to be less time with your family. It's going to be work on the weekends. It's going to be work early in the morning. It's going to be more late at night. But the fortunate thing is you at least know why you're doing it. You know you're doing it because of your commitment to this individual and that individual has to be with their families. I'm not doing it to like make some partner rich. I'm not doing reason my work, I'm doing this directly connected to the impact um, that, that we want to see. Um, but at the same time, if it's not a calling for you, you really shouldn't be doing this kind of work. The, the stakes are, are far too high. Um, I'm asking for a friend. When I ditch my jury duty service, <laughs> is, that, is that a problem? I'm really glad you asked that question. <laughs> I can't count the number of times someone's come and asked me and said, hey, I got this jury service, how do I get out of it? <laughs> Let me be clear, we do not want anyone, especially people who come into this room or I think have an open mind, uh, to ditch that jury service. Um, <laughs> whatever your views of the system, for the person sitting next to me at council table, they want as many people coming into that room with an open mind as possible. And that's what we're asking for. And the reality is that particularly for you know, diverse communities, people of color, the reality is it's really difficult when you have a young African-American client uh, from the baby you next to you and he looks out at this supposed jury of his peers that he's read about and sees no one who looks anything like him in the room. I'm gonna share a story with you. Um, I was defending, uh, it, it's coming to mind this case I was just talking about young African-American uh, from the baby charged with a very serious case, carrying life in prison, quote unquote, um, gang allegations, even though in my opinion, they were labeling him as a gang member just because he was associated with people in his neighborhood. And there was a juror, a white juror, who said, you know what, I don't think I can be fair in this case. And I said, why not? And he said, because you keep on talking about a fair cross section of the community, um, but there's no one from the baby on this jury. There's no one who's African American on this jury. The district attorney had just kicked off a Filipina social worker from the Bayview who was on the jury. Um, and I have no idea how he's gonna get a fair trial. And another juror said, yeah, even if you just look at sheer numbers, there should be more blacks on this jury. And then a third juror said, yeah, you keep on talking about a fair section, but I think we failed in trying to accomplish that. And almost the whole panel started clapping. Yeah. So I think San Franciscans know that this is an issue, but one thing that has to happen is people have to show up, you know, um, and and be there. And that's the one little thing that people can do. And it's really important that we have as many open-minded, have as many diverse perspectives as we can have, as have as diverse a jury as possible in the room. And it's also whether I mean, the reality is you're probably not going to get onto that jury because there's only 12 who are going to be there with a couple few alternates. But just to be there and be part of the process is really important. We need as many voices in the room as possible. So please, if there's one small thing that can be done, please show up at this meeting. It's super important for us and our clients. Um, this is a question for the audience about how we balance the needs of, um, of women, particularly women who have been sexually assaulted, um, given some of the things you talked about today about, about money bail. So how can we be sensitive to victims' rights and sexual assault cases while keeping all the things discussed today in mind? Well, I mean, absolutely people have to be sensitive to, you know, to all needs of all, you know, all, all people, all impacted people in the system from both the accused to the complaining witness. Um, our job is to obviously, you know, cross-examine case cross-examine, defend our clients as well as possible, but it's not our job to actually determine what ultimately happened. That's up to the jury or in some cases the judge. Um, and that determination is going to be made by, uh, you know, by the judge in terms of what happens uh, pre-adjudication. Pre uh, but I think what's
it's really important that we not just look at things in terms of, you know, we, we talked about sexual assault earlier on, there's so many different things that can be charged with in that realm, and what has to be happened is people have to look individually what exactly is the accusation in the particular case, and, and you know, it's just gotta be a detailed analysis on a case-by-case -case basis. But of course, you know, victims need to be protected also. Um, but that doesn't take away from us having the, but being protected does not necessarily mean through bail. You know, if, if there's gotta be detention, it's going to be detention. But it still doesn't have to be based on how much money we have. You've mentioned a few times this evening that we should take a case-by-case -case, um, approach to a lot of the decisions that we make in the punishment system. And there's a question from the audience that says, in cases where algorithms are used for pretrial risk assessments, how can we make sure that they don't in, that they don't oppress historically oppressed communities? We have to continue to work <laughs> on the algorithm to make sure it doesn't do that. I mean, I've a lot of the what some of the questions have to do with people that you associate with, and there'll be questions about you know any neighborhoods that you're from, and those are all things with implicit or explicit biases in there that often have you know racial racial connotations to them. So we just have to you know once we've gotten rid of a system, money be that doesn't mean that we don't have to keep on working to come up with an even better system. And uh, and I think another thing is again to get to get really proximate what we really need is more people coming to court so we can really get a full flavor of who that individual is so we're not just looking at algorithms. There's um, um, Silicon Valley Debug in the South Bay has started that process of community participation, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to bring more of that to San Francisco because the real way that people should be making that determination is not just look at algorithms, but let's actually bring the community in mm -hmm. and talk to them and have them speak about whether this person is a safety, whether there's a flight risk, and to make a real determination with you know, collective community input. Uh, and speaking of um, community, what are ways that we might be complicit in the punishment system, and how do we reverse that? We as residents, as voters. Um, I mean, I, I think in, in all of our work, I think both in the punishment system and how we view communities of color and folks that are living um, on low incomes or in poverty is, is to see the power in each person, and I know that sounds kind of hokey, and, and sort of pie in the sky, but it truly is. If we, if we commit to living in community and getting to know each other, um, we do a lot of pro bono work. And I look at the lawyers that do work with us, and we are constantly having conversations about the fact that it's this, this othering, that this time that we live in right now is all about othering and, and, and demonizing anyone that isn't us. And in order for our entire community to function differently, um, it's literally understanding the reality of the person um, that we're working with. And so when we talk about pro bono attorneys, we really have a lot of conversation around how do we help help that be a two-way um, experience. Those of I mean, anyone in this room, I'm sure, I'm just kind of judging from the room that everyone has done some sort of community service or some sort of service in their life. It changes us more than it changes the person that we support. Um, how do we ensure that that experience um, not only serves the clients and, and provides the legal support that they need, but it's actually an opportunity to open hearts and minds and change um, the community in a different way. And so I think, um, Leonard can answer the specific question about the, the punishment system, but I think in general, what we need right now is this idea of, uh, of serving and learning from each other and having it, it be a partnership um, and, and really truly believing in the power of the person sitting in front of us. Um, and, and supporting that and not coming in. I, I, I talk a lot about charity-based service and um, if we're going to change that um, way that we want to be in our community, it's to really look at um, it not as charity, but as really respecting the rights of the person in front of us and saying, how do I, how do I use whatever skill I have or whatever um, time or resource I have to help, um, help you get to actually claim your full power Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative um, down south. He talks about, in terms of reforming um, uh, you know, the system, especially where he's at, where he's 
only representing people essentially on death row, four concepts um, that are crucial to changing the system. One is proximity, actually getting closer to the individuals or communities, because the reality is there are a lot of policies that are justified based on not knowing someone. Um, when I had law students coming through for the summer who were like, I'm not sure if I want to be a DA or, or a public defender, and they come and meet my clients, and they're like, she seems really nice, he seems really nice, why is she, why is he in custody? Once you actually meet people, your sense of, of you know, who someone is in relation to the system completely changes. So proximity is one of them. I recently uh, had the honor of going to San Quentin and meeting some folks who are in the culinary program, and I'm sure that if any of the people in this room had actually met them and spent 10 minutes with them, they'd probably say they should go home now. And some of them are they're there for two more years, they're there for three, they're there for five more years, but once you have that half an hour with them, that, that perception would change. Uh, so proximity, I would say, is one. Two is just changing the narrative. Like, so many narratives are based on certain data points, and if you actually just told more, then you're just flipping the narrative. We get to do that most often, and oftentimes only when we're actually in trial and we get to put on our, our own evidence, because so much of the system is based on solely the prosecution evidence, and only when we actually get to trial are we able to fully put on our own evidence. Uh, three, especially in this climate, the willingness to be uncomfortable. Because when you truly fight for justice, the reality is the system will come, come back at you sometimes. And we have to be willing to, hopefully with the support of your community, be willing to stand up to that, um, to whatever the powers may be to be impinging on you, whether it's a judge. We had an immigration attorney who was continued to argue, and the judge basically had the deputy sheriff's deputy escort her out of the courtroom. You know, um, didn't put her in handcuffs, but was basically like, "You're leaving right now." You know, we've had attorneys who are vigorously, you know, fighting for our clients. You know, sometimes either the judge is threatening to sanction them, or actually sanction them for, for, for just fighting hard for our clients because we think we're, we're you know we're fighting too hard. Um, and I would say probably most important is to actually be hopeful. Like despite all the problems in this system, we've seen us have well, small victories, policy victories, um, and everything in between. We have gotten good results, you know, with the right level of preparation, with the right skill. Um, when you actually get closer to your clients and their family, and the jury can feel in the courtroom that you actually know more about the situation than anyone else in the courtroom, you can have good results, and we've seen also the pendulum turn even nationally. I mean, it used to be the mantra of the folks in the Democratic Party was tough on crime, and now they're sort of <laughs> all sort of tripping over each other to say how more of a you know, criminal legal system reformer than you are. So I think we have, you know, through more public awareness uh, and you know, just generating more insight into the system changed the climate, and we also recently saw that for the A selection in this city. Speaking of public awareness, how many folks in here watch How to Get Away with Murder or <laughs> Law and Order? Okay, there's some, yeah, I see, there's a few hands. I see some nods, I see some smiles, I see some people feeling embarrassed. <laughs> um, my question is, how much of what we see on those shows, how much of that is accurate? Are there misconceptions being, are, you know, are there misconceptions that are being, you know, put out into the world when we watch those shows, or do we all have legal degrees now? <laughs> you know, that's a tough question because there's a lot of shows out there. Having said that, I'm gonna I'm gonna plug a couple shows. Well, I'm gonna plug a movie first of all, which is Twelve Angry Men, both the initial one and the new HBO version, which is much more diverse, multicultural, right? Because in that movie, you see. Um, all of these jurors coming to a conclusion. I'm going to get it already. Sorry. So we're safe. Coming to a conclusion based on essentially stereotypes. And you, you know, you have one juror who's like, no, let's actually look at the evidence. Let's actually like try to filter away all the implicit biases and that you're making your decision. Let's actually look at the evidence. And this one juror was able to flip 11 jurors, uh, the other 11 jurors, uh, to not guilty. Um, has anyone seen uh, The Practice? Boston, uh, aggressive defense attorney show. I have to admit, Eugene was like, I mean, the way he's able to succinctly tell, admit, deliver a closing argument, is, there is actually a skill, because when you see, you know, them doing closing arguments on TV, it's often you're distilling 
into about 90 seconds. Some people may take some less than three hours. And I think there is a skill in terms of actually being able to still the core elements of the case. You know, so I've actually tried to pick up skills, but I can't for more stations. <laughs> 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 Do you have an equivalent? Is there a television show or a movie that you think accurately depicts uh, your work? <laughs> um, I watch really bad television material, <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask. Um, I just throw out some good movies to watch. There's a um, there's a good movie on soccer that goes around the world and um, talks about. I actually really loved it because um, it went back into Rwanda years later and talked about the Gacaca system, which is a restorative justice system, and talked about the role of soccer and sports. And, um, and in different countries. And so um, my husband's really obsessed with sports and race, and so I get tied into like, oh, we can watch this because it's human rights and, and, and civil rights at the same time. Um, so there's some really good good shows like that. Shut Up and Dribble is really good too. We've got a few more questions from the audience. I will, I think I'll read these two together. Uh, incarceration is also family separation and inevitably traumatizing. How can we abolish a system of incarceration that harms families? And are there any US cities and states that provide a restorative progressive model for criminal justice reforms? Can you speak about them and what it would take to create that here? 